In our weekly episode that covered the coup in Yugoslavia, a bunch of you wrote in the comments that it was really British-backed or caused by the British. So I thought today I would address that issue. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special episode. That coup on March 27, 1941, brought to power General Simovich, Air Force Chief of Staff, two days after the former government under Regent Prince Paul had signed the tripartite pact, joining Yugoslavia with the Axis powers. Many people thought that the new government would publicly align itself with Britain over Germany. But though it did not, both Hitler and Churchill believed the coup to be pro-British. In Churchill's memoirs, he calls it one tangible result of our desperate efforts to form an allied front in the Balkans. Not only does Hitler think that Britain is behind the coup, but the official German analysis blames BBC Serbian broadcasts and says that the British Secret Service was behind the pre-coup agitation. But in what ways was the SOE, Strategic Operations Executive, and the Foreign Office involved in the events leading up to March 27th. In 2017, David Stafford wrote an article for the Slavic Review after examining recently released British wartime documents about the extent of British participation in the coup. It is very good. There will be a link below so you can read it yourself. Anyhow, using that and doing a little more digging here and there, I thought I'd share some thoughts and conclusions. The British attitude toward Yugoslavia had changed quite a bit in the five months leading up to the coup. That was mainly because of the changing situation in the Balkans. Italy had invaded Britain's ally Greece. Hungary and Romania joined the Axis in late 1940. Britain was worried about a German invasion of Greece. And of course, once Bulgaria joined the Axis March 1st, Yugoslavian neutrality was not good enough for the British. They wanted an active ally. Even if Yugoslavia was not directly attacked, their forces were to join in a campaign against Germany should the latter attack Greece through Bulgaria. In short, British policy towards Yugoslavia in early 1941 became a function of the British desire to save Greece. That was not especially attractive to Yugoslavia, and Prince Paul even refused to meet with British Foreign Minister Antony Eden. But Britain did everything they could to prevent Yugoslavia signing the Tripartite Pact, which would destroy all chances of an allied Balkan front. On March 21st, when three Yugoslavian government ministers resigned over the imminent signing of the pact, Ronald Campbell, British minister in Belgrade, suggests encouraging a coup to Eden. Campbell says there are four things to consider. One, if a German attack on Greece is not imminent, should they delay a coup to not precipitate one? Two, a coup or revolt must take place at the moment of greatest effervescence. In other words, just after the signature of the pact. Three, the people making the revolt need to be assured that Britain will break off relations with the current Yugoslavian government and support the new government. Four, they have to consider the Croats and their attitude. Both Eden and Churchill answer Campbell's telegram. Churchill writing that it is more important to get Yugoslavia into the war anyhow than to gain a few days on the Salonika front. And basically from all the exchanges, you get the idea that the main thought was the effect a coup would have on the Greek situation. Also, any decisions made will fall on Campbell's shoulders and Britain will maintain relations with the current government. By March 24th, therefore, Campbell had full authority to encourage a change of government or regime, that is the removal of Prince Paul, by any means, including if necessary, a coup d'etat. What, however, was Campbell's assessment of the situation as the Belgrade legation perceived it? Would a coup d'etat achieve the desired objective? Were there other alternatives? If not, what were the chances of a coup? Campbell says straight out that no government can remain in power without the army backing it. So the coup must be a military one. But military support might be tricky since Paul can present signing the pact as fairly harmless. So Campbell figures that the most senior army leaders would have to be removed from their posts and that it is vital that the British offer military supplies. That would give them something to approach potential coup leaders with. However, since Campbell also knows that the British ability to supply armies with arms is stretched to its absolute limit, the likelihood of a coup is thus not very great. So once the pact is signed the 25th, Alexander Cadogan, permanent undersecretary at the Foreign Office, thinks 
that while still supporting and maintaining relations with the government, they should work for the secession of the Yugoslavian army in South Serbia and the creation of a separatist government under its control, which he said would give us control of the vital passes to prevent a German attack on the flank of the Greek army. On the 26th, Churchill telegrams Campbell to not let any gap grow up between you and Prince Paul. At the same time, do not neglect any alternative to which we may have to resort if we find the present government have gone beyond recall. Campbell has now said several times though that he thinks the offer of arms is essential to the creation of any sort of alternative government. Even if there is no coup, it's still of primary importance. He feels that German influence will now play on the internal divisions and disintegrate Yugoslavia. So. Our efforts must be directed in the main to stiffening Serbian resistance, the more so as South Serbia is vital for us and Greece the vital point. So that BBC speech by Leo Amory, British conservative politician who speaks Serbian and does so in the speech, he speaks many languages, broadcast to Yugoslavia. Just after that, denouncing the pact and appealing to the Serbs is not just promoting a coup, but trying to stiffen Serb resistance in general. But what about the SOE, the Special Operations Executive? They are active in the Balkans. In fact, in the SOE's first directive, November 25th, 1940, interference with Romanian oil supplies to Germany is a top priority. It's discussed again in December and January, and George Taylor, Chief of Staff to Frank Nelson, head of SOE, is sent to the Balkans to prevent the Balkan countries from falling under German influence, to make plans for the organization of resistance should these efforts fail, and to disrupt oil supplies. Taylor and Tom Masterson, who had previously been running SOE activities in the Balkans, write a full report of their activities in June, which cover coup and pre-invasion activities. By March 18th, when it is clear that Paul will sign the pact, the SOE objective is the fall of the Yugoslavian government, preferably before the signing. The first stage of this plan is discussed the 19th, and it focuses on a legitimate solution, convincing enough members of the government to resign that it precipitates a government crisis. Those three cabinet members do resign on the 20th, two of them from parties subsidized by the SOE. But when that isn't enough to delay the signature, the SOE recommends a coup. However, none of the organizations and opposition parties the SOE works with has army influence or are organized enough to do such a thing anyhow. The work of the SOE in this period was essentially to urge the necessity of a coup d'etat on all their contacts in the hope that as soon as someone took the first step, everyone else would rally behind him. SOE links to the Air Force conspirators who actually do the coup are only indirect, however, though they are pretty well informed about its progress. So they turned down a suggestion, not an official one, from London to blow up the train carrying the signatories home from Vienna since they think that would result in martial law and ruin the Air Force guys' coup plans. Campbell is still arguing the necessity of an offer of British arms and that no anti-government activity can be expected in the near future. But that doesn't jive with the SOE though, right? Here's the thing, they were not holding back anything from him and Taylor meets with him daily so why would Campbell discount or ignore the SOE's intelligence? Well, Stafford points out that by Campbell's own admission in 1942, he did not have much respect for the SOE. They did a great deal in Yugoslavia and usually did it ignorantly. Campbell further writes, they were always toying with the idea of staging a coup d'etat in favor of the very political leaders who are now in the Yugoslav government. I always resisted this on the grounds that the political leaders in question were well past their prime, and it was not at all certain that they any longer represented Yugoslav opinion. That brings up the possibility that Campbell did not pass on SOE information to the Foreign Office because of his disapproval of the leaders or of the coup itself. So no word is sent to the Foreign Office until a telegram the 26th about General Simovic, Boromirkovic, and the actual coup. And it does not arrive until after the coup has actually begun. The telegram says that Simovic expects war with Germany to result and that Yugoslavia would attack the Italians in Albania. It hopes Britain would defend Salonika. So basically, the telegram gives Britain everything they want and without them having to give any firm promise of material support. The information conveyed in the telegram, 
was undoubtedly in large part responsible for the high expectations of the Simovich government and for the subsequent disappointment when it failed to live up to its promise. Now, once the coup has happened, there are British individuals who are quick to claim a role in encouraging it, but officially it is a Yugoslav affair, no matter how welcome. Stafford draws three conclusions. First, although the British considered a coup, and after the 24th, Campbell was authorized to encourage one, the Foreign Office saw it only as a last resort. Second, there is a discrepancy between Campbell's assessment of things and the SOE's knowledge of the development of the actual coup. And third, and I think I'll quote Stafford again to end this episode. The SOE's political links, which were important in the early stages of the crisis, were overtaken in the later stages by the direct and close links between the Air Attaché's office and the Air Force conspirators. But however close these links and whatever persuasion the British exercised, it is still clear that the initiative came from the Yugoslavs, and only by a stretch of the imagination can the British be said to have planned or directed the coup d'etat. Well, that is it for today, but I will see you each and every Saturday with the regular episodes. Again, a link to Stafford's writing is below. Now, we did several Between Two Wars episodes about Yugoslavia in the interwar years over on Time Ghost History. You can see one of them right here. Support us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv so I can write more amazing stuff like this. See you next time. Mm -hmm.